If you're joining us for the first time, a few months ago I bought a huge Neo Geo lot with 6 systems, 12 controllers and 5 games. In episode 1 we repaired a somewhat collectible, older, 5 volt unit. And in episode 2 we cleaned up and BIOS modded a later revision 9 volt unit. With those two out of the way and a Neo Geo CD in the backlog, here we have the remaining 3 AES consoles. Cosmetically, all three of these systems look okay. The first of these is a 181K serial number. Second system is a 183K serial number. And at least at first glance, the last unit looks like it might have some broken mounting screws. The top cover is not properly attached to the bottom case. And this one right here is the most recent of the bunch. It's a 213K serial number. If you're wondering why serial numbers matter when talking about Neo Geos, I've added a couple of resources in the video description that I found helpful. In the previous episodes, you guys saw me tear the units down to find out what power adapters they need. And I'm glad I did that because it turns out I actually did have one 5 volt unit. And like I mentioned before, the serial number is not a perfect way to figure out which version you have because the system's notorious for being case swapped. But I've been scratching my head and I found a really cool way that you can figure out whether you have a 5 volt or 9 volt unit without taking the system apart. And all you need is your cell phone. And I'm going to demonstrate that with this old iPhone that I have. Do you guys see what we're looking for? One of the additional components that the 9 volt units have is a large coil. And we can see that coil in the corner there. You guys saw it here first, folks. First time on YouTube. You know, for the one person out there that this tip is actually gonna help. But this ended up being a huge time saver for me. I was not prepared to plug these units in without being 100% sure whether they ran on five volts or nine volts. And it looks like all three of these units do indeed run on nine volts. This first system seems to be testing fine and everything's working as it should. Neo Geos run a very basic self test when they're powered on without a game inserted and blue means that all systems are testing okay. I'll have to test these more thoroughly off camera, but to my delight, the second system is also working as it should. Three for three? What would the odds of that be? Perhaps a little concerning that one side is wide open like that? No blue screen here, so we might have some problems. Let's try that one more time and see what happens. There's no point trying a cartridge if the system fails the basic self-test, but just for the sake of science, let's see what happens when we pop in a game. Perhaps the random colors have some texture and pixelation with a game cartridge inserted, but in any case, the system's faulty. Alright guys, let's take this unit apart and see if we can figure out what's going on. This is the side that was loose and it looks like we have the screw but it's not screwed in. We have another screw that's not screwed in, so clearly someone's been in here before. Ah, 
I'm going to start off by just taking a look around the board, see if anything obvious jumps out. The power circuit here looks okay. Here we can see the Sony RAM, the Yamaha sound chip, and the Toshiba CPU. This is the area that needed trace repair in episode 1, but here everything seems to look okay. This imprint here is where a circular post on the top case rests directly on the motherboard. Very strange design, but thankfully it looks okay here. And here we have the Z80, which the Neo Geo uses as a sound coprocessor. Look at what we have here, a socketed BIOS chip. This is an EEPROM, it's obviously not the original BIOS, and it's socketed, so I'm immediately suspicious of this area. Someone could have damaged some traces removing the old BIOS and installing this socket. This is going to be the first area that I take a closer look at. Hmm. We have some pins that aren't soldered in. This might be promising. There are some scrapes in this area, not the most gentle BIOS installation. And that looks like some sticky rosin flux to me, which probably should have been cleaned off the board. The strange thing is all these solder joints actually look pretty good. I'm not sure why a couple of pins were skipped, but that's obviously the first thing that I'm gonna try and correct. Nothing to see here, folks. Let's just pretend that didn't happen. Well, by the end of this, I became a pro at removing and reinserting this chip. It helps to leverage it out bit by bit by going back and forth so that it pops out straight. Anyway, I have a bunch of Neo Geo biases. I'm going to use one of the original ones off of one of my Japanese systems. Using a known working BIOS will help me quickly eliminate that the problem we're having is because of a bad BIOS flash. All right, still having the same issue. At least I can cross that off the list. Time to solder in those few missing pins. Now, I'm finding continuity across these three pins, and that's something that you'd normally be concerned about, but here's some borrowed footage from episode 2 without a socket in the way, and we can see that pins 2 and 3 from the top are no connection pins, so basically they don't go anywhere. Let's see if that made any difference. It looks like that wasn't our issue. I decided to try reflowing all the pins on the BIOS socket. And I'm already thinking ahead to myself that if this doesn't work, I'm going to remove the BIOS socket and inspect for any broken traces on the other side that maybe I can't see. So this is the part of the project where I started to get tunnel vision. I'm so focused on the BIOS area because I know someone's been in here before and worked on this part of the board. But as we'll find out later in this project, there was a clue under my nose the whole time that I just chose to ignore. Trials and tribulations, folks. I ended up getting there in the end, but let's watch the journey unfold and see how I got there. Okay, no bueno. Next, I decide to do some voltage checks on all the main chips on the board ground probe on any random screw hole, and I start with the DC jack, getting 9.3 volts at the input, down to the voltage regulator, looks like I'm getting 9.2 volts at the input, and nothing on the output, but that's because the console's not turned on, so let's go ahead and switch it on. 
and the perfect 5 volts on the output so the regulator is doing its job. When I check random chips, usually I'll just probe the corners. The voltage line is almost always one of the four corners. I will check pinouts for some chips where I don't find the voltage this way, but for a quick and dirty test, this will usually take care of 90% of the chips on the board. So for the CPU, I didn't find the voltage on the four corners. I looked up a pinout and it looks like voltage should be coming in on pin 14, and that's exactly where I find it. This step alone took me about half an hour. I'm not gonna show the whole process, but by the end of it, I was satisfied that the board was properly energized. All right, now we're splitting hairs. I found a few traces next to the CPU that looked a little bit tired. I'm gonna go ahead and check them for continuity. Maybe we can find something here. Nothing over here, all these traces are good. Moving on, a little cloudy area above the CPU right next to the cartridge slot. I could barely see this thing, I had to take out my magnifying glass. This pin disappears underneath the cartridge slot and it doesn't pop out on the other side. So I'm thinking there's nowhere else for it to go but one of the cartridge slot pins. Let me see if the pins to its right and left go to the cartridge slot. And the right pin certainly does. And there's the left pin. And curiously, there's a cartridge slot pin in between where those two pins make contact. Now, this is just a guess, but it would make sense that adjacent traces travel next to each other. The way circuit boards are designed, if the traces were traveling all over the board like a bowl of spaghetti, it wouldn't be very efficient. So I'm feeling optimistic that there's a broken trace here. I start peeling back the solder mask to expose some copper. Oh my god, I can't believe it. Alright, well, you can see where I've been busy scraping. Check this out. Right past this white line, it makes contact with this pin right here. And then no continuity once we travel a little bit further down. Now, I didn't pay attention to this during the teardown, but look at the amount of rust on the cartridge door spring. Some amount of moisture had to have traveled down the cartridge slot, and I completely overlooked the problem area when I was doing a physical examination of the board at the very beginning of the video. But once I saw that someone had worked on the bias area of the board, none of the other clues really mattered, and I got a little bit tunnel visioned. Anyway, time for some surgery on this board. Let's go ahead and fix that trace and then see how we're doing.
And now all three traces are testing good. Oh my God. Wow. Wow. Let's try it with the game. Unbelievable, guys. Unbelievable. Well, now that we know it's working, I want to try it with the BIOS that it shipped with just to see what they put in there. All right, guys, here I'm testing Samurai Spirits because this game is entirely in Japanese. So if we have a European or a US BIOS on the EEPROM, then this game should boot up in English and it should say Samurai Showdown. Not the case. The game's still entirely in Japanese. I don't think this is a modded BIOS either. I tried booting up the console with all the special key combinations that modded BIOSes support. So unless I'm missing something or there's an older Neo Geo hack that I'm not aware of, I think this is a stock Japanese BIOS. Well, that makes this BIOS chip completely worthless to me. And since the system's already socketed, I'm just gonna pop in a universe BIOS. Let's turn this into a US system and then give the game another try. All right, let's set the region to USA and mode to console and restart the system. And there we have it, we're playing the English version of a Japanese cartridge, and the title screen displays the English version of the game, which is Samurai Showdown, rather than Samurai Spirits. To prevent future oxidation, I'm just going to apply a little bit of nail polish to my work area. Last, but certainly not least, let's give the case a good cleaning and take care of that rusty spring.
Was that a crazy repair project, guys, or what? Holy cow, I loved working on this project and I couldn't be happier at the outcome. I now have five working AES consoles. Um, something that might not come across in the video though is you know, the hours and hours of raw footage that go into distilling a video down to 15 or 20 minutes. And I spent a lot of time working on the BIOS area of the board. I assumed that because someone had worked on that part of the board that that's where the issue was gonna be. And I kind of ignored other clues that were right in front of me. I actually noticed that rusty spring when I took the top cover off and I made a mental note that I was gonna come back and clean that up. Um, and a short while later, during the physical inspection, I noticed that smudge under the cartridge slot, but I had already decided that the issue was gonna be in the BIOS area of the board. So it took me a while to kind of open my mind up to the issue potentially being somewhere else. So just something to keep in mind when you're working on, on projects like this, you know, follow your own repair methodology or your own advice. If I had done that, I probably would have found the issue a lot quicker. In terms of what's next for this series. So we still have a Neo Geo CD. I have a bunch of universe BIOSes and, you know, mods that I'm planning to do on a few of these systems. I have some ball tops coming in for the controllers. So there's definitely going to be more Neo Geo stuff down the line, but Something that I'm glad that I've kind of realized this early on in my YouTube journey is that I don't have to buy expensive exotic consoles to grow my channel. And what I mean by that is, you know, this, this lot cost a small fortune. And I shared that in the unboxing video and there were more costs associated with all the other parts and the power adapters and the biases and the bias sockets and all that jazz. Whereas something like my Xbox 360 video which is a console that I bought for $5 off Craigslist. Granted, it's my most disliked video, but it's also brought in the highest number of subscribers and it's made me the most money. So go figure. Um, this series wasn't nearly as popular, but you know, there's that niche audience out there that, that love this console and I've really enjoyed engaging with those folks. And I have some personal history with this console as well. I mean, I can't even describe the nostalgia to you guys that I feel when I work on these consoles. I... I, I never owned one as a kid, but but I knew that it was there. I always saw it in stores. And as a kid, you know, like you see these bigger cartridges and, and they're all fighting games and you, you just want one. So at the end of the day, I think I'm going to continue working on consoles that I find interesting and projects that I find enjoyable. But there is that balance to be had between, you know, things that uh, have broader appeal versus things that have a very kind of niche interest. So there's a balance maybe that I need to kind of figure out and, and strike there, but uh, make of that what you will. In any case, I hope you enjoyed this project as much as I did and uh, stay tuned for more Neo Geo stuff, more repair videos, and I'll see you guys again soon.